everyone. So welcome to Open Source Licensing. Whoops, let me get this out of the way at least. Open Source Licensing 101. Jim Jagelski here. Jim Jag is my uh, Twitter handle. So uh, definitely feel free to follow me. Uh, a little bit about myself. Um, if you have heard of me, you're most probably aware of my uh, reputation in the open source community with uh, uh, the Apache Software Foundation, which I uh, co-founded and served as director and other kinds of good stuff uh, for a long, long period of time. Um, I still consider myself a developer at heart, um, and I still contribute to a whole bunch of open source projects. And to pay the bills, I am the open source program officer manager at Uber, which is a fantastic company. In fact, I just joined. This is going to be my second week uh, there at, uh, at, uh, at Uber. So anyway, first things first, let's get this clear. I'm going to be talking about licensing, but I am not a lawyer. So uh, please don't think that this is a complete guide to everything legal. My goal in this is to provide some really good basic information for developers to figure out what licenses are best, what licenses um, do, what the conditions are, what the requirements are. But certainly in all cases, double check with actual legal authorities. I would say like about 95% of this is directly applicable but um, it's the 5% that you want to be uh, careful with. So definitely make sure to check with somebody if you have any kinds of questions out there. So why, uh, why spend this time talking about uh, open source licensing? Well, first of all is that, um, and this is something that maybe many people may not know, copyright is the default. Um, as soon as you create something, um, as soon as you publish something, it is under copyright. And really, no one has permissions uh, or very, very limited permissions on what they can do with it. So say, for example, something is up on GitHub, but it doesn't have an open source license uh, associated with it. Well, you really don't have a lot of permissions, legal permissions, to be able to uh, you might be able to copy it, but you can't uh, modify it, you can't use it, you can't do all kinds of things with it because it is under copyright. Copyright is something that needs to be actually licensed or given away. So just the very fact of promoting it or putting it up on a public site does not remove copyright restrictions. Uh, it's got to be under a uh, open source license for it to be an open source license. Uh, secondly, open source is everywhere. I'm kind of trying to, I'm holding up the camera. Sorry about the shaking. Um, open source is everywhere. Um, you can't be inside of IT or anything that touches IT nowadays without there being some open source you know, associated with it. So since you're constantly going to be touching open source, since you will constantly be interfacing with open source, and since in many ways, the license is the main touch point between open source and you, uh, you really need to worry about it because the license determines how you can use it, how you can reuse it, and how you can distribute it. And not understanding these conditions, not understanding the requirements, uh, means that you are taking on some level of risk, maybe not a lot of risk, depending on what uh, you know, the license are and the, uh, the people that you're using it from, but it's still something you really want to, you know, make sure that is, is all good. So definitely this is the reasons why. Now, some of the licensing goals is to basically ensure which parts remain open source. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Another goal that people use when they're creating an open source license or determining what open source license makes, uh, makes the most sense is to maintain some level of control or authority over the code and the direction of the open source project itself. And again, we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Uh, another reason is to provide some sort of common implementations for open standards and open protocols. And you choose the correct open source license depending on how ubiquitous you want that standard to be how uh, universal you want this protocol to be. If you want it uh, somewhat more restricted, then you go in a different kind of license outside there. Uh, what we've been seeing a lot nowadays is that there are uh, commercial and community marketplaces for a lot of this open source code out there. 
And so being able to build a community or commercial marketplace around this open source project, uh, creating an ecosystem around this open source project, figuring out how to monetize or commercialize an open source project. These are all factors to consider when you're talking about which license is applicable and the goals available to you in choosing a license out there. Now let's talk a little bit about the, the concept. Open source actually started off as an offshoot of the free software movement. And in this particular case, it's free as in free speech, not as free as in free, uh, free beer. Uh, and this is the reason why, at least in, in uh, English, uh, free software has this, uh, I guess, this idea that you always have to say that. You always have to say that, oh, I'm talking about the freedom aspect of the software, not that it's given away for free or there's no money associated with it or something like that. And so open source was a way of reframing that idea such that you're not always talking about that, that differentiation about what free means. For people who are free software advocates and certainly the Free Software Foundation, software freedom is a moral imperative. It is something which the license is designed to really ensure, to really make sure that this is always the case, that software should be freedom in the same way that people should be free. And so you'll see that a lot of the free software uh, copyleft licenses out there. It's all about ensuring this level of software freedom. Now, for something to be uh, under the, uh, the Free Software Foundation, um, there are four basic freedoms that must be uh, maintained. Uh, these are the, the guidelines that determine what is or is not a free software license, or really what the free software movement is, is about. Now, really, we can really think about free software and open source as pretty much the exact same thing. In fact, in many places, you'll see it talked about as FOSS, F-O-S-S, -S, for free or open source software, or sometimes even FLOSS, where L stands for Libre, uh, which is, you know, Spanish for free and freedom. So sometimes you'll see it as FOSS or FLOSS. It's just about this idea, this concept of open source and free software. Now, for something to be considered an open source, it must be under an OSI approved open source license. OSI is the open source initiative, and they're basically the gatekeepers of what is and is not uh, open source. And they have an open source definition, which is a list, uh, a, a list of 10 criteria that uh, the licenses must comply by. Uh, licenses must comply by these 10 criteria for OSI to approve them as an open source license. And really there are a large number of open source licenses out there, uh, at least 60 or so uh, counting up there. Um, certainly we're not increasing the number of open source licenses as we have been doing in the heyday, but uh, you still see open, new open source licenses getting approved, but it's getting harder and harder for them to get it be uh, approved. Um, so the Free Software Foundation has uh, four freedoms. Um, OSI has 10 criteria. I kind of think of it as basically promises. Uh, and I think we can actually distill it down to three main promises that must be a factor or consideration in open source licensing. Um, the first is, first of all, let's just pretend, for example, that open source um, and uh, the code associated with open source are the same as cookies, an Oreo cookie, for example. And I'll be using this uh, quite a bit uh, in uh, later on. So not only is the code the cookie, but also the recipe in creating the cookie is the same as the actual source code in creating the software program. I think the first promise that people make when you're using an open source license is you're able to use that cookie in any way you want to. Not only the cookie, but also the recipe as well. And normally, of course, what you do with a cookie is you eat it. That's the normal expected use. But you can also make a gingerbread house cookie, and that's an acceptable use. There are no restrictions on how you use the actual cookie itself, but also how you use the recipe. You can do anything you want to do with that recipe, so by making it allow people to use the recipe and the cookie in any way they want to, 
is one of the promises that's inherent inside of any source open source project and any open source license. Uh, the other promise is the ability to modify both the cookie as well as the recipe. Just say you have a traditional uh, chocolate chip cookie recipe. Um, well, if you weren't able to modify it, if you weren't able to like add uh, nuts to it or more sugar or more brown sugar or something like that to it, well, that would be a pretty useless recipe because you weren't able to modify it to your conditions. Uh, open source allows you to modify it any way you want. Not only can you modify the recipe itself to fit whatever needs you have, but you can also modify the resultant cookie in the same way that you can use an existing open source program and use it as part of your development stack, as use it as part of your commercial stack. If someone originally, excuse me, uh, wanted to use um, Drupal as just as a CMS system, for example, but you wanted to use it for some other unique uh, usage, you were able to do so. So even though the original design for a software program may be for a specific requirement, open source allows you to modify that use for anything else. And thirdly is the ability to share, to share your modifications, to share the resulting cookie, to share all aspects to it. And the great thing about um, uh, sharing software is that it's not a zero sum game. In the same way that you're able to, uh, you know, share, um, you know, imagine every time you shared a cookie, it magically regrew itself. So in this situation, those two girls, they're sharing half a cookie. But it's not that way when you're sharing code because you're not dim diminishing or decreasing the amount of cookie goodness that you have. Um, it's, 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 it, you're not giving anything up by exercising that ability to share. So you're able to actually share the software itself, the program itself, but also the original recipe as well as the modifications associated with that recipe out there. And I think in general, you know, when you start to boil down the open source definition and the freedoms of the free software movement, it's all about using, modifying, and sharing source code and resulting programs associated with that source code out there. So let's actually talk a little bit about the licenses per se. And again, we're going to, you know, we're going to carry on this, uh, this, uh, this analogy with pretending the cookies and code are the exact same thing because that helps us get around some of the uh, confusion, some of the complexities associated with that. Now, the first type of uh, open source license out there is what I call the, the give me credit kind of open source license. Uh, these are also called permissive licenses and most probably the three most popular open source licenses that comply with that. Uh, are the uh, the Apache license V2, uh, the MIT license, and the BSD license. And the criteria for this particular license says that uh, you can do basically anything you want to do with the software and the project that's under this open source license. Uh, as long as you give us credit, as long as people are aware that you use an open source license uh, software project, and you give them the URL or the pointers to where they can download that license, we don't care what you do with it. You can uh, sh shrink wrap it and make it a proprietary product, that's fine. You can go ahead and add additional functionality or capabilities to it and either choose to share or not share those, uh, those modifications, that's all fine. There's no problem at all. So it really means that as much as possible, there are few restrictions to use this software project as there are. And I'll go into a little bit more examples in details associated with that. But basically the idea again is that there is give me credit. That's all you need to worry about is give me the credit for the open source project. And what you want to do with it after that point is all free and clear. It's all up to you. No restrictions at all. The second type are the, the we copy left license and the, the Eclipse public license and the, uh, the lesser GPL, the LGPL are the two best examples of that. And that basically says that um, if you're using my software project, the uh, software uh, that's under a uh, we copy left license, 
then you're able to do anything you want to do with that, uh, with that project. But if you actually fix the source code, if you actually modify or improve the code that you're using that's under a weak copyleft license, then once you start distributing that larger work, once you start distributing something which is based on or built on that software license, well, you need to provide a copy of those fixes back to the larger community. Now, the upstream community may choose not to accept those fixes, but you need to make sure they're available out there. Uh, the idea being behind it is that, hey, you know, you're using this software project. Um, I want it to be open source. If you're improving it, well, it just makes sense that the other community members who are using this We Copy Left software project benefit from the improvements and the and the uh, modifications that you've made anything else you do to the larger work that combines that i don't care what you do but if you improve what i shared with you you need to share those improvements with the larger community as well and that is basically the condition and the requirement of the uh, of the weak copyleft licenses uh, out there uh, this was originally made for uh, software projects, which were, um, you know, libraries, you know, bolted on libraries that added some specific definitive functionality inside there. And that's the reason why a lot of people think the, the L in the LGPL stands for, for, for library instead of a somewhat more um, permissive uh, GPL, um, you know, uh, a library out there. Um, but that's really not the case. But if you think of libraries as sort of like one of the reasons or the rationales behind this, uh, you wouldn't be that very, very far off the mark. The third type of license is uh, what I call the give me everything. We have the give me credit, the give me fixes, and this is the, uh, the give me everything uh, standpoint. A lot of people call this a viral uh, type nature, a viral type license inside there. The strong copy left license, the GPL V2, V3, and the Afero uh, uh, GPL models, um, you know, they are, you know, in, in, as I said before, in some communities uh, considered viral. And even though that kind of like gets the point across, it really does have a negative connotation to it. So I kind of like look at it as sort of like, uh, imagine the, uh, the software project that you're using as sort of like the GNU B pollinating your um, your software project, your your larger distributed work. So everything that it touches, everything that it pollinates, everything that it improves, well, that also now, now to be, needs to be under GPL as well. So as you see, as the GNU bee right here swings back and forth and pollinates these flowers, they turn from being under no license or whatever license they were under to now being under a GPL license. So everything that the GPL touches is now going to be forced to be under a, a GPL strong copyleft license. Again, when you think about um, the, the guidelines and the goals of copyleft being ensuring software freedom, then that really makes a lot of sense because Right now, these flowers right here on the on the left hand side, uh, because they're not under a strong copyleft license, they might be under either copyright or a, a weak copyleft or even a permissive license. Uh, they're not free in the in the in the way that uh, the Free Software Foundation wants them to be. And so, if you use something which is GPL in those software projects, then they must become free also. Now, I understand that that, uh, that concept is a, uh, a kind of a kind of weird um, mentality, you know, that, that's kind of, you know, uh, hard to understand what that uh, what that means and, and things like that. And that's where the cookie comes in really, really well. So I'm going to take this cookie right here, this Oreo cookie. Um, and let's just imagine for a, a start second that uh, this was back in the day when Nabisco was just making the Oreo cookie. Um, and they had an idea for it, you know, basically, you know, two chocolate cookies with the filling in the middle. Um, and they didn't want to bother, you know, uh, making the uh, the actual cookie itself or coming up with the recipe for it. Um, now, this, you know, the special filling, the, that white gooey, fantastic, is, is proprietary. It's a trade secret. 
Uh, that is something that they uh, created themselves and they don't want to share that with anyone. The cookie, eh, it's a cookie, it doesn't matter. So you just say they went online and they found a cookie recipe that was under say the Apache license, for example. So the recipe for this cookie was originally an ALB2 permissively licensed cookie. So Nabisco took it and they, uh, they said, oh, that's great. That'll work perfectly. That'll make our, our perfect Oreo cookie. Uh, we'll use that recipe, but it was too crumbly. Every time they tried to stamp, you know, the Oreo logo in it, for example, it would crumble. So they would need to make modifications to that original recipe to make it still crispy and fun and tasty, but able to hold that, uh, that shaping really, really well. Now, because the original cookie recipe was under the ALV2, a permissive license, there was no reason for Nabisco to share those changes. All they needed to say is like, hey, if you like the Oreo cookie that we sell, if you're interested in the original cookie, this part, cookie recipe, then go here. But the modifications they made to that original cookie recipe could still remain proprietary to Nabisco. They could share it if they wanted to, but they didn't have to if they didn't want to. And as far as the overall cookie itself, where, of course, that was something that was Nabisco specific. No one else could copy that. No one else could go and, and you know, simply by using an open source cookie recipe, the entire cookie itself was still proprietary to Nabisco. Now, the second example is let's pretend that instead of this recipe being a permissively licensed cookie recipe, it was an LGPL, the give me fixes type. Uh, uh, open source license. Well, in that case, whatever modifications they made to it would need to be shared back. They would need to go and say, we took this original cookie recipe and here's the link to it, but we also modified it in this way. We um, added, um, uh, you know, some stabilizers in it and reduced the amount of, I don't know, you know, baking powder or something like that. And they would need to make those uh, those changes um, available to everyone else. So if they wanted to make an exact copy of this this cookie itself, they could. But the combination itself was still proprietary new to Bisco, and certainly the uh, the white gooey filling that uh, that you know delicious part that everybody just you know eats 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 that recipe is still closed source. It's still proprietary new to Nabisco, no matter what they have to do and share the modifications and recipe for this, that's still secret. There's no reason to share that. That's what the, uh, the weak copy left says you have to do. Now, let's assume that this was under GPL. GPL V2, a strong copy left license. Well, in this case, yes, of course, the, the modifications and the changes to the recipe would have to be shared with everyone. But because this combined cookie would not be anything without this part of the cookie, that meant the recipe for the entire cookie, this derivative work, this combined work would also need to be under GPL which meant that this would need to be done under GPL, but also the special icing. The, the middle part of the Oreo cookie, Nabisco would have to release that shared secret. So you can see this is the reason why in, in many ways, in many cases, people call it a viral nature. It's because this was GPL and because we're using this to create this cookie, the entire cookie is now GPL and the entire cookie and the recipe thereof has to be associated with that. And that's the reason why in a lot of cases you'll see in corporate environments, uh, when you're talking about uh, acceptable, you know, incoming open source projects, uh, they're very, very much okay with permissive licenses because it doesn't prevent them from doing it. But if you want to build a project or build a product related on uh, an LGPL or a GPL related code, there are some conditions associated with it. There are some concerns associated with it. And so with that in mind, let's start thinking about some of the ideas associated with governance models and how this actually affects the open source projects that you're talking about. So 
back again with the slides. And there's our Mr. Ganubi right there, back to us. So to start talking about the governance and community models associated with open source projects, because in many ways there is this natural alignment between open source licensing and open source governance and community. Uh, the first type is what I call a, a walled garden kind of an environment. And basically this says that um, you can use our software project, you can take advantage of all the freedoms and liberties and criteria that's associated uh, under the open source license, but it's usually controlled by a single corporate entity. So you can look at it, you can enjoy it, but as far as being uh, an active contributing member of that open source community, it really is tightly controlled. Um, it's not really a community-based open source project. It's a corporate-based open source project. It's still an open source project because it's under an open source license, but it really isn't as collaborative, as consensus-based as you want, uh, as you would like. Now, certainly, um, these are popular uh, uh, open source projects for companies that want to commercialize or monetize their open source projects out there. And so you'll see in a lot of cases, most of these walled garden kind of open source projects are under a strong copyleft license. They'll usually be under a GPL or a GPL because the, the entity that's releasing the open source project wants to release an open source project but they wanna have ultimate control and authority over that and really ensure that no one can use that open source project that they're using and, and um, you know, beat them at their own game you know, or, or take advantage. So if anyone creates um, you know, and builds on top of their open source project, because it's under GPL, they've got to release those fixes back. And so any competitor would be at a disadvantage in this type of environment. The other type of open source project uh, uh, governance model that's out there is what's called the uh, benevolent dictator for life model. And this situation, it really is community focused. It's, it's really driven by the community, but there is at least one person, maybe a small handful of people who have the ultimate control, ultimate authority on the direction, growth, and future of the open source project. They determine what patches get, get approved and what patches don't get approved. And you can think to yourself, well, what's the difference between that and the walled garden kind of environment? You know, you still have this basically this, uh, this dictator, this central authority determining where the project goes. And the difference between the walled garden and the BDFL is that in the BDFL, the community has bequeathed that power to the benevolent dictator for life. So even here, the, the, you know, as Dennis says in, in Monty Python and Search for the Holy Grail, uh, supreme executive power directs, uh, derives from a mandate from the masses, not from some farcical aquatic ceremony. Uh, the community decides, hey, you know, Linus, we trust you enough that uh, we are comfortable with you having ultimate control, ultimate authority on where the Linux kernel goes. So in the walled garden environment, uh, the power is basically just assumed by an entity, whereas the benevolent dictator for life, it is given by the community to that trusted uh, benevolent dictator. Uh, and that's the reason for the difference uh, between those two. Um, in the BDFL uh, environments, there really isn't uh, a best fit or best case open source licenses. Um, all open source licenses are viable, uh, you know, models associated uh, uh, with this. And there really isn't one that fits better for, for anything else. The final type is what I call the, uh, the meritocracy model. Now, I do understand that uh, meritocracy has, uh, you know, in, in some places a, a negative connotation. Uh, the idea of meritocracy is that uh, your your contributions are what matter. It's not who you are, but what you do, what you provide. Uh, you know, you don't gain merit. You don't gain influence by who you are or, you know, um, you know, who pays your salary or things like that. It's what you provide to the project. And I certainly realize that there are a lot of open source projects out there that claim to be a meritocracy, 
where they really, really aren't, that their value of meritocracy uh, has uh, really, really bad values such as, you know, uh, skin color, race, sexual orientation. That's a, that's a bad value of meritocracy. That isn't good meritocracy. Meritocracy is really about valuing all contributions and valuing all contributors. So meritocracy is all about creating collaboration, consensus building. There is no single boss. It's all about the community itself driving the project. Uh, and in many cases, uh, the most successful uh, meritocratic uh, open source projects are those under a very, very permissive license. Uh, the ASF, the Apache Software Foundation, every project is under this uh, meritocratic process because we believe that uh, for an open source project to grow and thrive, you need a healthy and viable community and ecosystem about that. Um, and that just more naturally and more readily happens the more permissive a license is because it encourages all kinds of contributions, not only from uh, individuals who are volunteering their time, you know, based on the side, you know, after work or during the weekends, but also from corporate uh, instructors and corporate uh, contributors who don't have to worry about any sort of viral natures with uh, with copyleft concerns. Um, so uh, I'm coming pretty close to the end. So a couple of things, you know, uh, the AOV2 is becoming increasingly popular. And I think the reason why is because unlike uh, other permissive licenses, it has an explicit uh, patent clause. Uh, I, I think if you're looking at a, uh, looking into a, a, an open source license and you want to get permissive, I would definitely choose the, uh, the ALV2 um, if, that's, uh, if that's what you want to do. Uh, open source is not a business model. We've been seeing a lot of FUD, fear uncertainty and doubt nowadays, with people claiming that the reasons why their businesses uh, and their revenues are not what they should be is because uh, bad people, bad players are using their open source projects and not giving uh, things back when the open source license they chose did not require them to give things back. Uh, they're exercising their freedoms. They're exercising uh, the, the liberties that you gave them. So open source is not a business model per se. Uh, open source is a way of developing software. Uh, it's a model that you can use to create a product and a project, but it's not a business model. So let's make sure that we don't, uh, you know, uh, try to combine the two, even though there is a lot of overlap between them. Uh, dual licensing is now a thing. It's generally not a bad um, idea. Uh, I mean, it, it generally is a bad idea because it creates confusion out there. Most of the people who are proponents or proponents of dual licensing are those who want to create a, a commercial viable business around it. So what they'll do is they will uh, release their open source project under an extremely strong copyleft, one which has, um, which makes people, um, you know, somewhat worried, somewhat concerned. Uh, they're not exactly sure what the conditions are, what the touch points are. Um, am I giving away the keys to the kingdom? Do I have to release my proprietary stuff? Uh, the, so the same way that Nabisco would have to with the icing if the cookie was copyleft. Um, and so what they'll say is like, yeah, we're releasing it as, uh, as open source. So we have an open source project out there. It's under a strong copyleft, which will cause many people to not use it. But if you're concerned about it, we will also sell you a proprietary license. Uh, that's usually most of the times where you see dual licensing out there. Uh, really avoid confusion and edge cases as much as you possible. And don't forget about incoming uh, contributor licenses. Um, when you're, you know, having an open source project, uh, make sure that people understand that what you're doing is also having uh, contributions come in and make sure people are, are aware what those incoming contributions are so you can consume them inside of your open source project. Uh, some of the takeaways is that a license is a tool. There is not uh, an always right license. There is not no one size fits all type of license. It really depends on the kind of community you're trying to build. Uh, the trying what you're trying to do as far as uh, releasing the open source project. If, if what you're trying to do is create an open standard or an open protocol, trying to get as many people to use it as possible, then a permissive license is most probably the best fit. Uh, if you're trying to release software that you want to create a business around, then something which is more copy leftish uh, makes the right sense. Uh, take time to decide on the right license site. 
um, don't just, you know, you know, when you're, you know, creating a repo on GitHub and MIT is the first one on the pull down, uh, don't just pick that because it's easy. Take some time because it can be incredibly difficult to change licenses, you know, midstream. And a license will have a direct impact on, you know, your adoption of the open source project and how people use it. So always specify a license and always make sure that you're looking at uh, why you're open source and something and taking care of and choosing the correct license type out there. Um, as Scott said earlier, all this will be taped. So all this information will be available. I also put the slides up on, on SlideShare, slideshare.jimjag, uh, slideshare.net slash jimjag. Uh, I encourage you to follow me. I'll be here, uh, here virtually all day. So if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to, uh, you know, to chat me, to, to network me or like that. This is my, uh, my email address. So if after the fact, say tomorrow or a couple of days later, you want to, you know, get some clarification, don't hesitate to, uh, to uh, send me an email and things like that. Um, I think we've only got maybe, geez, two minutes left or something like that which is certainly not enough time for, for Q and A. But as I said before, um, definitely make sure that if you have any questions or concerns to reach out, contact me, get my contact information in there. Um, I really appreciate everyone uh, attending this session. Uh, competition was fierce. So the very fact that you took time out of your day when there were so many other great sessions going on to uh to see this session about such a dry boring non-techy subject as licensing means a lot to me enjoy the rest of the day uh stay safe take care of yourselves and um enjoy the rest of the day thank you all